Yo, what is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Zen Lounge. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Corium and one of the projects, one of the companies that are validating on the Corium blockchain. We're going to be talking all about informal systems and the CEO behind this project. And we're going to be learning about Cosmos on a deep level. So this is actually going to be a longer video. So if you really want to learn what Cosmos is all about, we're going to learn from the CEO so Ethan Buckman is the CEO of Informal Systems, and he just recently had a video come out uh, called Cosmos and the Error of Community Computers. I just watched the entire video, and it's probably one of the best videos for someone new just learning about Cosmos. Uh, it's a great video for you guys to watch, and this is the description. At the heart of the Cosmos is the idea that so sovereignty and interoperability are the keys to a sustainable civilization. Communities across the globe of varying scales should be sovereign over the infrastructure and applications that domain their lives. And such sovereign communities should be interoperable with one another, able to successfully cooperate despite their differences. Since 2016, Cosmos has been pursuing the vision by developing an internet of blockchains. The Cosmos technology stack allows developers to build application-specific blockchain, blockchains turned to the needs of a particular communities and use cases. In this talk, Ethan Buckman, co-founder of Cosmos, outlines the vision for Cosmos and what is to come in the new era of community computers. So this video is going to play. Um, if you guys, I recommend, if you're new to Cosmos, following Ethan Buckman on Twitter. He has uh, some great posts, interesting mind. But yeah, guys, this is my Corium update for today. We're sitting at 26 cents. We're up 6% today. Pretty exciting. Um, and we should see more news coming this week, everyone. So have an awesome day anymore. Some support the validators on the Corium blockchain and have an awesome day. Peace. Hi, everyone. Ethan Bachman here, co-founder of Cosmos, CEO of Informal System and president of the Interchain Foundation. Sorry I couldn't be with you in person at this Hack Adam, but uh, I at least recorded a video to talk a little bit about some of the, the history uh, of technology, of computing that has inspired Cosmos and that led us to be sort of where we are and, and to give an outline of really what we're, what we're trying to achieve with the Cosmos philosophy, the Cosmos vision, the Cosmos technology stack, uh, and even the Cosmos hub a little bit. So um, I want to wish you all you know, best of luck in, in the Hack Adam and hope you're all having a, a great time. And again, I'm sorry I couldn't, couldn't be there, but um, let's kick off into a little bit of this, of this history and talking about you know, where Cosmos came from and, and maybe a little bit even about where it's going. So to get right into it, if we're talking about the history of, of computing, you know, we're coming from a background of uh, telecommunications and, and building vacuum tubes and you know, analog kind of computing and ultimately hitting on a new kind of substrate for building computers, this being silicon, right? And so we have this long early history of computing technologies that led us to finally be able to build silicon microchips on which we might start this new era of computing. And the first thing we did with this new computing technology, uh, the, these chips, was build mainframe computers and this seemed to be you know the the thing that made the most sense and we would build these big computers and they'd take up you know whole rooms and they'd live in basements of IBM or Dell or, or, or wherever and this was thought to be the main way uh, computing would be accessed and used because it was too expensive or didn't really make sense for individuals to have their own computers of course you know we know how that that story shakes out but just thinking about mainframes there were, there were many problems with mainframes being the primary way that we would approach computing they're big they're bulky they're expensive they don't permit uh, you know, scalability, there, there's difficulties in scaling them both socially and technologically. Uh, everyone who's using them is exposed to the same, the same software, the same substrate. They can't customize them for themselves. If the mainframe goes down, it's down for everyone. If it needs to be upgraded, it has to be upgraded for everyone in the same way. So there's lots of challenges with, you know, the main, uh, main approach to computing being mainframe computers. And, and so while mainframes may have spawned a new kind of era of computing, they ultimately weren't really the revolution that would that would change our lives in the way they have been changed and of course that would require the personal computer 
and the personal computer revolution, which, which ultimately enabled every individual anywhere on the planet to have access to this incredible new computing technology to now have multiple computers per person. You have laptops, desktops, cell phones, you know, computing technology is everywhere and the personal computing revolution, which put the power of computing in everyone's pocket, on everyone's desk, on their lap, is really what, what really transformed things. And what's so powerful about the personal computer is it enables each individual to be sovereign over their own computing device, to decide what kind of software goes on it, when they turn it on and off, when they upgrade it, how they use it, how it looks. It's completely within their control, what kind of computer they buy, what they do with it, and so on. And everyone you know, customizes their computer, they put you know, the stickers on it representing uh, yeah, the brands they like or, or whatever, but the point is the personal computer really gives sovereignty to the individual to relate to that kind of computing technology in a new way that, that was completely different than anything that came before. It, right? And so we should really think about that, the personal computing revolution, as something that completely changed the nature of, of the individual's relationship with technology. Of course, it didn't just stop at creating personal computers and distributing them. Ultimately, all of those personal computers start to become connected to each other, right? They become interoperable with each other. So it's not just about the sovereignty over, over your personal computer. It's also about having interoperability with all the other computers out there. And that was really, you know, the heart of, of the internet revolution that went along with the personal computing revolution. But if we think about, you know, so now we have these personal computers, uh, now we have this internet, and then how did things sort of evolve from there? Of course, more and more computing moved off of personal computers and ultimately moved into the cloud, which were, again, something like mainframes, but now we're in big data centers. We're, ha we're you know, computing in in, on machines that are owned by somebody else, as they like to call the cloud, somebody else's computer, and owned by Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or whoever owns you know, these data centers and, and, and massive companies. And, um, and, and with that comes a change in, in the kinds of things we can use computing for, and all these new kinds of applications can be built, and you know, the cloud enables all this, all this amazing stuff, but, but still has certain problems with it. And ultimately, we move on from the cloud in, into a new era, um, a new kind of, of basic substrate for computing that we now know as blockchains or what we might call consensus computing. And in the same way that the silicon microchip enabled a new era of computing to emerge, the blockchain consensus computer enables a new era of computing to emerge. It's a new kind of technology that allows us to do you know, new kinds of things, build new kinds of computing machines. We might call them blockchain computers, blockchain computing machines. But just like once we had the silicon microchip, the first thing we started to do was build mainframes because that's what made the most sense. Now that we have blockchain computers, the first thing we did again was to build mainframes. And, and you can imagine you know, how this story is going to unfold. Uh, there's just like with, with the original silicon mainframes, they were bulky, they're big and expensive, and we had all these, all these problems with them that make it so that they can't scale to the world's computing needs. We have the same problems with our blockchain mainframes that we have today, these systems like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, you know, which builds itself as this world computer. As amazing as it may be, and as important as it may be to our future, it alone is not going to be sufficient to serve all the world's blockchain computing needs, just like mainframes in the past weren't sufficient to serve all of the world's computing needs. And so that begs this very natural question, what is the personal computer equivalent in the world of blockchains, right? Just like we went from mainframes to personal computers, with silicon technology, now we're going to go from mainframes to some equivalent kind of personal computer with, with blockchain technology. And of course, since all of you are here at, at this Hack Atom and all of you are probably familiar somewhat with Cosmos and, and, and the way we think about these things, we believe that the revolution that is afoot now is what we might call the community computer revolution, right? And just like we had personal computers as a way to give individuals sovereignty and then interoperability with their personal computing devices, now we believe in a new kind of approach to computing, the community computer that will give communities sovereignty over their own computing infrastructure and yet still be able to access interoperability with the many other communities out there using their own community computers, right? And so this, this community computer revolution should really enable any community to boot up its own blockchain computing infrastructure and applications and be completely sovereign over how that community computing technology is used, the values that it represents that really enable that community to express itself, to be sovereign over itself, but still be able to be interoperable with all the other community computers out there. So. Uh, what's the technology that really enables this community computer thing to tick, to happen? Well, it's the Tendermint Byzantine Fault Tolerance Consensus Engine that, that we built over the years that is now 
uh, arguably the most successful, the most general purpose consensus technology out there that really allows any community to boot up their own community computer and build arbitrary applications in whatever programming language they want uh, that uses you know, very simple, standardized consensus under the hood that's you know, extremely robust, been very well tested, battle tested in many different, many different scenarios, is now being used to power you know, 50 or so public cryptocurrency, proof of stake blockchains, and in the future, potentially many, many more, both public and private, and everything in between blockchains uh, for whatever whatever use case, however communities want to use them, right? And that's 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 really the power of Tendermint BFT, just being simple but very general purpose, and being able to really power this community computer revolution. But just like just like in the personal computing world. Uh, you know, just having sovereignty over your over your machine wasn't enough. It was really about having interoperability and giving us an internet of, of computers in the same way. We believe it's not enough to just build community computers. We really need to enable an internet of them, an internet of blockchains, right? And that's really, as, as you're all aware, uh, the heart of, of Cosmos, this internet of blockchains idea that we can not only provide technology like Tendermint BFT to create your own community computer to serve the values of each community, but that we can also have protocols for interoperability Operability, what we call IBC, the Interblockchain Communications Protocol, to enable arbitrary communication, interoperability between these community computers, ultimately giving us an internet of blockchain. And so IBC today, very, very powerful technology, very general purpose. You can think of it like TCP in the, in, as a sort of internet equivalent for arbitrary kinds of communication between different blockchains. And we've seen, you know, we're starting to see applications be built over IBC. And you can have many different kinds of applications. Some people like to think IBC, oh, it's just, you know, some bridge technology that, that Cosmos built is just like any other bridge technology. Of course, this isn't true. It's much more powerful than just some kind of standard ad hoc, you know, bridge technology. We built a very general purpose transport and communication layer that you can build arbitrarily complex applications on top of, token bridging is just the first, just the simplest, right? And so we have today something like 50 blockchains connecting with each other uh, over IBC. You can see this image of MapaZones, beautiful website, mapazones.com, showing us all the different public blockchains today and, and the connectivity between them. Many of them are, are, are currently just using token transfer, but more and more we're starting to see them adopt new IBC applications, things like interchain accounts, soon there'll be interchain security, and, and many other kinds of applications that can be built on top of IBC to really empower and enable things we couldn't even dream of in, the, in this internet of blockchains. Okay. So we have this internet of blockchains. It's amazing. There's all these blockchains coming and going. You can think about all the all the kinds of incredibly innovative and experimental applications you might build, and really the the collective this combination of Tendermint BFT and IBC and the Cosmos SDK and all these tools for building chains enable community to experiment in all kinds of crazy new ways, trying lots of different kinds of of applications, and you know some very risky, some less risky maybe. But the point is, any anyone, any community can really experiment with new kinds. Of of, of, of applications in this community computer landscape. But amidst this you know, thrashing sea of innovation, we have been building one particular blockchain, the Cosmos Hub, to be a sort of anchor in that thrashing sea, to be a very stable, conservative chain um, that, that, will, that is intended to be there for the long term, to take fewer risks, but to really be a, a kind of stable, conservative anchor that can always be relied on, can always come back to, that has a minimal set of features, you know, what, what we might call hub minimalism, in contrast to the you know, explosive of innovation uh, around us, right? So, so for instance, of course, there was you know Terra, which had a very ambitious goal to create a new kind of decentralized money and build a whole ecosystem around it. It was extremely, extremely innovative and exciting application that you know many of us, uh, many of us got involved with and, and bought into. But of course, the level of, of risk it took in the end turned out to be too much, and that experiment, you know, tragically came crashing down. And and, and there will be others like it, and and there, you know. Communities can decide for themselves. This is the flip side of sovereignty. With sovereignty is a great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. And you can take these big risks, and some of those risks are are, are going to fail. And that's just that's just the way it is. But you know, collectively, as we build out this internet of blockchains, we can build out different. We can take different risks across the different chains. And, and the Cosmos Hub is committed to taking a minimal amount of risk to being a really stable place uh, to support the internet of blockchains in the long term.
And one way we think about the Cosmos Hub is as a kind of a, a port city, a, a place where other chains can connect to, receive a basic services from, the hub can serve as an on and off ramp, a place where people can custody their assets, a very, very high security location that will take minimal risk, that might not be on the frontier of, of innovation and experimentation the way certain other chains might be, but is really there for the long term to sort of smooth out some of the larger volatility and to still be able to provide the kinds of services and applications that other chains in the ecosystem will need and that they'll benefit from, from having such a stable, secure, conservative, very high security blockchain like the Cosmos Hub uh, to serve them. And, and one of the most uh, exciting features coming up in that sense is interchain security that will leverage the, the security of the Cosmos Hub, the staked atoms to enable new chains to launch within the sort of Cosmos Hub umbrella and leverage the security of the Cosmos Hub for their own applications. And that will open up new kinds of experiments uh, under and around the security of, of the Cosmos Hub, which will again change the landscape of this internet of blockchains we're building and allow new kinds of services to be provision. And ultimately, you could think about the Cosmos Hub as a blockchain whose fundamental values are those of Cosmos itself, sovereignty and interoperability, right? And as we've, as we've said in the sort of history of computing and then also in the history of blockchains, these values are really at, at the core of the evolution of these technologies and what makes them successful and what they enable for, for individuals and then for communities to be sovereign over their own computing technology and yet to still be interoperable with the computing technology of many other uh, communities or individuals out there. And the Cosmos Hub is committed through its own application to serving these values of sovereignty and of interoperability. Okay, so where does that take us next? Well, of, of course, there's you know blockchains have been incredibly, uh, incredibly successful in a sense. They're being adopted across the world. There's lots of different applications being built, both on mainframe blockchain computers like Ethereum, but also on community computers within the Cosmos ecosystem. And and many many people are excited about DeFi, decentralized finance, building you know innovative financial applications where where communities can and people can come together and pool liquidity and do strange fancy new things that are much more difficult or impossible even to do in the realm of traditional finance. Now, it's very exciting and we're unlocking all kinds of new new potential and reducing barriers to entry and you know making new kinds of financial applications possible but at the same time it seems there's a little bit over emphasis and over focus on the decentralized aspect of, of decentralized finance and and while decentralized decentralization is great and is hugely important to what we're trying to build it's a means to an end it's not an end in itself and sometimes I get the impression that focusing too much on on DeFi as a sort of decentralization misses the actual you know real world impact we're trying to have at the end of the day, which isn't so much, let's say, decentralization as it is about maybe collaboration. And this is why we prefer to refer to collaborative finance as the kind of thing we're, we're really trying to build, and uh, what, what we might call co-fi, collaborative finance, and different kinds of applications that are really focused, you know, while decentralization and censorship resistant and all these things are still important to them, the ultimate ends they're trying to achieve are, are a greater sense of, of collaboration and improving the relationships between individuals and communities in society and the natural world, right? And so we have, you know, many people referring to refi or, or regenerative finance, but we actually want to go beyond that and, and looking at social impact um, kinds of applications and, and other forms forms of monetary applications where communities can come together and really be empowered to, to do things differently than they've been able to do under traditional uh, financial regimes. And so, you know, we, we have some, some various examples here of, of projects we're, we're really excited about. We have the Regen Network, one of the flagship uh, Cosmos projects and ReFi. There, there's IXO doing social impact bonds. And then we have other projects um, that are, you know, maybe a little bit peripheral to Cosmos, but are thinking about using Cosmos technology and are really, you know, also focused on this kind of collaborative finance um, uh, approach folks like the resource network that are building mutual credit systems and grassroots economics also building mutual credit systems and we have uh, the IDCC time bank in Hong Kong doing really interesting work on enabling communities to trade sort of hours with each other and then there's an, a, a kind of application we're really excited about um, at informal systems that we're actually building something now uh, about that's called trade credit clearing enabling communities to uh, to access you know much um, mu uh, to really save on li their liquidity requirements by looking at the substructure of the payments graph uh, in a really innovative way that may actually allow us to, to form a new foundation for the monetary system that's a lot more nuanced and, and a lot more informed than just sort of you know typical blockchain rhetoric about ending central banks and you know everyone just using Bitcoin there's a lot more to the story and we're really trying to dig in on what that would actually look like so at the end of the day 
the, the, really the message is that you know the point of computing, the point of computers is to empower people, right? And and in many ways, uh, they've they've failed to. They they have empowered people in some ways, but they've also empowered you know mega corporations who are taking ownership over over everyone's data and their lives. And and in real ways, there's a sort of digital colonialism that's playing out uh, across our social media, across the way the internet is architected, and 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 it's a real issue. And 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 this is why you know sovereignty is so important, and this is why interoperability is so important and and this is why collaborative finance and what we're trying to build there is so important to pushing the pushing things forward to resolving some of these issues this is why the community computer is so critical and why the internet of blockchains is really the future of uh, of technology of computing technology of the internet and ultimately this is why cosmos so with that i wish you all so much luck with with the hack adam i'm looking forward to seeing what you all built uh, again i wish i could be there for you uh, be there with you i am there for you at least uh, but uh, good luck with everything and 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 thanks for the opportunity to to present to you um, you can check us out online informal.systems of course cosmos.network and have a great uh, hack adam take care everyone